So it says in Hebrews 10, 28, it says, Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. You know, this journey that we're on, this walk of faith, you know, it's all about advancement, advancing. It's all about progressing. It's all about moving forward and taking ground. The Bible tells us that the righteous, they go from strength to strength, from one degree of glory to another. And it's not God's will for any of us to be stagnant, to be like the Dead Sea, so to speak, where no life lives and where no river flows. You know, God has come that we would have life, that we would flourish, that we would be fruitful, but we need to follow him. And the Bible tells us that Jesus is our good shepherd, but know this, that Jesus walks. And he says to each and every one of us, come, follow me. And we are called as believers to walk in his steps, to follow Jesus, to follow his example, and to do as he has called us to do. For some people, though, they, they just don't move. They just stay in the same place where they got saved. They don't move forward. They're not following God. And for some people, they're actually even drawing back. And the Lord has no pleasure in the heart of those who do draw back. And that's what I want to look at. It's important that we don't draw back, but that we continually, as believers, press on and press forward in Jesus' name. This is what it says in 2 Corinthians 3.18, and it's the amplified version. And it says this, And we all with an unveiled face, continually seeing as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are progressively being transformed into his image, from one degree of glory even to more glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So again, it shows us that the Christian life is about growing in our understanding, growing in our knowledge of the Lord, growing in our faith, growing and going from one degree of glory to another. And this comes from the Spirit of the Lord. And you look at Jesus, right? And you see this in the Gospel of Mark. Jesus was always moving forward. When Jesus came to this earth, his goal was to fulfill the Father's will. He came to this earth, you know, to save mankind from our sins. And it tells us this in Mark 13 and 42. It says, now while they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was going before them, and they were amazed as they followed, and they were afraid. Then he took the twelve aside and began to tell them the things that would happen to him. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and scourge him and spit on him and kill him, and on the third day he will rise again. Jesus knew what was waiting ahead. Amen. Jesus came to fulfill prophecy and he didn't back away. He was brave, he was a warrior, he was, a, he was um, courageous and he knew what lay ahead. And he told the disciples three times he predicted what was going to happen to him in Jerusalem. It tells us that he set his face like a flint. He was determined to finish what he had been sent to do, and that was to die for the sins of the world. It amazed and frightened the disciples that Jesus was determined to give himself to those who will condemn, to mock, to beat, and to kill him. You see, Jesus was fulfilling the scriptures that spoke of his sufferings and his death. And when you read the Bible in the Old Testament, it's all about the suffering of the Messiah in Isaiah 53. It's all about Jesus' suffering in Psalm 22. You read all about the plan of God to redeem mankind and to get a people for himself all throughout the Old Testament. You actually see a red thread, a scarlet thread, the blood running through from Genesis right through to the New uh, Testament. Uh, Matthew, you see it all. And Jesus said this in Luke 24 when he was speaking to two of uh, the disciples um, after he had risen from the dead. 
He spoke to them and their hearts warmed within them when he spoke. And he says, everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And I was just thinking about Jesus. He set his face like a flint. He knew what was coming and he didn't back down. And some people perhaps in this room, there's things that you're facing and it's scary. There's things that you're looking at, you know, maybe, I don't know what it is that you're dealing with in life, but you're looking ahead and you're afraid to face the future. But you've got to be like the Lord our God who set his face like a flint. He fully trusted in his God. He fully trusted that God was with him and that God was going to fulfill his purpose and that God ultimately would rise him from the, raise him from the dead. And no matter how dark it is, no matter how scary it is, know that our God is with us. Amen? And that he is good and that he is faithful. And we've got to have this strength of Jesus like Jesus was able to have this strength. He was able to have the power. He was full of the power of the Holy Spirit because he walked in obedience and he walked fully surrendered to the Father's will. Amen. It says this, my weapon is my submission to the Lord. That's your greatest weapon in the world. That's the greatest weapon that you can have. My weapon is my submission to the Lord God, to the word of God. Amen. But this is what I'm amazed about, about Jesus. It's about his meekness. He, it tells us in the Bible, it says that he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. Meekness is controlled power or strength that's under control. He could have called a legion of angels to come and rescue him on that cross, but he didn't. Jesus, meekness isn't weakness, it's strength, it's power under control. Jesus was able to restrain himself and give himself and commit himself faithfully to the one who judges righteously, amen? Meekness is a controlled strength that puts everything into the hands of God. Meekness denies self. Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. Jesus was always looking forward. This is what I'm saying. He was always moving forward. He was always looking forward. He's the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. He knows all things and he sees the end from the beginning. And when he was on that cross, he seen the bigger picture. When he was going to Jerusalem, he seen the bigger picture, and the bigger picture is you. The joy that set before him was you, was you. He died for you, so that you can have eternal life, so that you can live a fruitful life, that you can come out of darkness, that you can be set free. He came for you, he endured that cross, so that you can be with him for all of eternity in heaven. The Apostle Paul says this in Philippians 3, 13, 14, forgetting the former things and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Paul forgot the things that was behind him. Paul never stepped back from hardships. Paul never stepped back from suffering. He pressed on and he looked forward and to receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Jesus Christ, had called him. He's seeing the bigger picture. That's what it's called to walk by faith, amen? We've got to see the bigger picture. It says our present sufferings are not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed in and through us on that great day. But there are people who don't press on. There are some who do draw back. And in Psalm 78 verse 24, this is what it says. It says the children of Ephraim being armed and carrying bows, torn back in the day of battle. 
Now the children of Ephraim, they were armed. They were carrying bows. They were strong. They were mighty. They were called by God. They were one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And the tribe was named after one of the younger sons of Joseph, who was the son of Jacob. And when Jacob was dying, he crossed over his hands and he gave the firstborn blessing to Ephraim instead of Manasseh, okay? So Ephraim received the firstborn blessing. He was blessed by God. And the blessing of God means this, to be endowed with divine favor and blessings. I just love that. To be endowed with divine favor and protection. His name means fruitful. It means that he was called by God to increase, to flourish, and to advance. His name also means fruitful in the land of my suffering. As I said, he was a leader of the 12 tribes. He was a skilled warrior. In Chronicles 12, it describes them as this, as being brave warriors, famous in all of their clan. Joshua, who led the Israelis across the River Jordan into the Promised Land, was from the tribe of Ephraim. The Ark of the Covenant was with this tribe for 400 years. So they were blessed. They were strong. The Lord was with them. They had the promises. They had the Ark of the Covenant. They had all of this. And yet we read that in the day of battle, they drew back. So why do some people draw back? Even though we are blessed, you are blessed. Emmanuel, our God is with us. The King of glory is inside of you. Who has overcome the world? Those who have put their faith in Christ. He who is in us is stronger than he who is in the world. We have no excuse to back down. We have no excuse to walk away. We have no excuse. Because the Bible is very clear that we are more than conquerors. That we are overcomers through the one who died and gave himself for us. So you have a power inside of you to overcome, amen? And they have the power. And they have the promises. And they have, you know, yeah, the promises of God all over them. And yet they drew back. Why do some people draw back? Well, in John 6, verse 66, this is what it says. From that time, many of his disciples drew back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the 12, do you also want to walk away? But Simon Peter said to the Lord, whom shall we go? For you have the words of eternal life. Some people walk away because they don't understand or comprehend the teachings of Jesus. The teachings of the Lord offend them. And especially in this day and age, especially in the world, in the culture in which we live in now, that calls evil good and good evil. And the teachings of the Lord offend. And people, I don't believe that. God is good. God's not angry with sinners. God doesn't send anybody to hell. Live as you please, so long as you're happy. God is love. It doesn't matter what sex you love. All of these things, the teachings of the Lord offend. And God forbid that his teachings should ever offend his church. God forbid. You know, when we hear things that are hard and confusing, we must not give up, but we must dig deeper into his word and ask the Lord for insight. And we've got to trust him with all of our hearts. Don't walk away because the teachings are hard. And because you don't understand it. Remember, everything in this world is anti-Christ. The system of this world is anti-Christian. The world will never get along with Christians. Jesus says, if they hated me, know this. They hated me first. 
they'll also hate you. So that's one of the reasons why people can draw back. Another reason is love for the world. 2 Timothy 4.10 says this, For Demas, who loved this present world, has deserted me. Now Demas was one of Paul's closest friends. He was his traveling companion. He was part of his apostolic team, so to speak. And he started off very strong in the Lord. And he fought alongside Paul, you know, for the kingdom of God for many, many years. You see that he was with Paul in his first imprisonment when he was in Rome. He was a trusted companion. Yet along the journey, his heart became hardened. His heart became cold. And he be maybe it was because he became so busy with the things of God, with the ministry, that he was neglecting the time, his intimacy, his communion, his relationship with the Lord. And his heart got cold and his heart began to draw back. And Paul was waiting execution. He was in prison and he was waiting to be executed. And this would have been such a lonely, difficult time for Paul. And yet in his time of need, Paul says about Demas, he deserted me. He left me in the lurch. He ran away, having loved this present world. And maybe it was because Demas, seen the end of Paul's life, says, I'm not willing to pay the cost. Maybe when he's seen Paul's end, that he was going to be beheaded for his fate. He says, self perseverance came in and preservation came in and said, I'm not willing to die for God. I still want to live. I've still got my whole life ahead of me. I'll come back to Jesus in a couple of years. Maybe he didn't want um, the hardships anymore. And he went back instead to a life of comfort. You know, it's hard to follow Christ. And the Bible teaches us that when we follow him, that we will be persecuted. But we've got to press on. We've got to see the bigger picture. We've got to keep on trusting in Jesus. And it says, and he who stands firm until the end, he's the one who shall be saved. But Demas drew back because of the love of the world. It tells us in 1 John 2.15, do not love the world nor the thing it offers you. If anyone loves the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. The Bible talks a lot about worldliness about worldliness and to guard our hearts against it. To be worldly means to be devoted to the temporal things of this world. It means to be concerned with worldly affairs to the neglect of spiritual things. To be worldly doesn't mean that we don't love creation. We're called to be in this world, but not to be a part of it. But what it means is, is that we don't conform, conform to this world's system which is by nature antichrist, that we don't conform to the pattern of this world. In the Bible, worldliness means the attitude and spirit of a person's life and ways. It's about the type of thoughts that we have, our desires, our feelings and attitudes towards people and things. It refers to the undue time and attention that we give things. That's what worldliness is. The Bible teaches us that worldliness is pride. It's the lust of the flesh. It's greed. It's gluttony. It's self-interest. It's snobbery. Envy. Quarreling. 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 Always being quarrelsome. That's all being worldly, the Bible teaches and yet it says in the word that the world and its desires will pass away. But whoever does the will of God will live forever. God wants to deal with these things in our hearts. You know, because we are called to be different. We are called to be set apart. And we are called to represent him here on this earth. Because of worldliness. Because of the comforts of life. Because of not willing to pay the cost. People drawback. They think that Jesus is expecting too much from them. And he is. He demands our all. As Hammy said, there's no sitting on the fence. 
There's no grey area. You're either in or you're out. There's the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of light. You're either in or you're out. And it costs Jesus everything for your soul. And he demands your all. He demands your heart. He demands your faithfulness. He demands your loyalty. He demands it all. And that means turning away from sin and walking in his ways. His, bo- his commandments are not burdensome. They are light. And they bring joy to each and every one of us. Amen. Some people, it's because of family pressure. I've seen so many people who are touched by the Lord and their families got around them and they gave in and they listened to what the families had to say and they walked away from God. Their family says, you're joining a cult, you're gone off the head, all of this, that and the other. And because of family's pressures, they draw back. But listen to this, Jesus teaches that anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or their daughter more than me is not worthy of me. If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of me. It says, whoever puts their hands to the plow and looks back, and with longing in their heart for the things of the world is not worthy of me. When I was a young Christian, I used to get confused about this scripture because I used to say, what? I, I have to love God more than I love my kids? Like, that sounds really, like, out there. Like, I have to love God more than my family. But what Jesus is saying is this, is that if your love and concern for your family is pulling you away from your love and devotion to Jesus, you're not worthy. So if your partner or if your children or whoever it might be is saying you're giving too much time to that church or you're doing this and all of this, that and the other and are trying to pull you back and because you don't want to lose them or you're trying to please them and you don't want to offend them or whatever and you listen in and you give in, that's drawing back and that's putting your family, family before the love of Jesus. Amen? And your devotion to him. Many people draw back because of offense. That's the number one. Because of disappointments. Because of difficulties. Because of distractions. Discouragements doubts, desires. So many people draw back because they just simply drift. And the reason why they drift is because they're not anchored in him and they're neglecting the fellowship of believers. So many people draw back because of the fear of man, because they're afraid of what people, their, their reputation. They're afraid of what people will think of them. And then so many people fall back simply through deceit through the deception of the enemy that says it's okay to live as you please. So how do we move forward in him? How do we, like Ephraim, flourish in life? How do we advance? How do we become fruitful? How can we live this abundant life that Jesus so freely gives us, amen? How do we? It's really simple, it's not hard. We abide and we remain in him. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. We abide and we remain in his love. We remain in his love. It says, anyone who loves their brother, anyone, sorry, anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. So it's about remaining in love and it's about loving one another. We love Jesus, but we also are commanded by God to love one another, to turn the other cheek, to overlook each other's faults and failings, to accept one another, to bear with one another, to forgive one another. This is how we walk into freedom. This is how we flourish. This is how we become fruitful because Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. And if you don't have the love of God, you don't have anything. Amen? You don't have anything. 
And how do we advance? How do we flourish? It's because we don't forget what God has done. We never forget the cross. We never forget the goodness of God. You see, it tells us in Psalm 78 that they turned back in the battle because they did not keep the covenant of God. They refused to walk in his law. They forgot his works and his wonders that he had shown them. They put everything just down basically to coincidence. They forgot the wonders, the miracles, the goodness of God in their lives. To be fruitful and to press on, the Bible says that you must rejoice at all times, in every situation and in every circumstance of life, amen? That we always thank him for the power of the cross, that we always thank him for saving us. Like there's things that God has done for you, he's healed you, always be thankful for that. He's delivered you, always be thankful for that. He's taken you out of darkness, always be grateful and thankful for that. He's put you in family, always be grateful and always be thankful for that. It's with a thankful heart, there's nothing more displeasing to God than a people who are unthankful and who are complaining and who are grumblers because guess what? That means that you have an evil heart of unbelief. They turned back because they lost their confidence. They lost sight of their high calling. They no longer trusted that God was able, that God was the one who goes before them, that God was able to deliver their enemies into their hands. Their hearts became hardened because of unbelief. They stopped believing in the promises of God. The Bible tells us, see to it that there is not a wicked heart of unbelief that turns away from the living God. Unbelief is disobedience and it's rebellion. Again, it says, if you love me, you will obey me. And the one who loves me will keep his word. What happened to Ephraim was quite tragic. He drew back. He lost his influence, his position. He lost the presence of God. And God raised up the tribe of Judah instead of him. And he chose David to shepherd his people. But the Bible teaches us again that we must be people who don't draw back but who are continually moving forward who are trusting in the promises of God who are pressing on and who are daring to believe and to walk by faith and not by sight amen so I just really felt this morning um yeah just to share that word because I just feel maybe there's some of you and you've stopped believing in the promises of God. You stopped trusting in the Lord and you're allowing the pressures of life and the pressures of family and you're allowing distractions and everything else like that just to pull you away from him. And I just feel today is the day to get right and to come back to him and, and to say, you know what? I'm not the cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back for me, amen? There's no turning back. I'm going to give my all. I'm going to follow him. I'm going to pay the cost. I'm going to lay my life down. And I am not going to give up because I will reap a harvest in due time, amen? 